Hi y'all, in this video I'll be responding to a video recently uploaded by Zonstar titled uh, quote, embracing the new mass shooting normal, end quote. Uh, Zonstar, I watched your video and left a comment, you may have seen it by now. It said something like, this video is disingenuous as all hell. Uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to presume that it's not disingenuous, that you've just stumbled in this conversation anew, you're unfamiliar with it, and uh, I'll talk about some of what you said, ask you some questions, and see if we can have some back and forth here and make some headway. Uh, take it away. Greetings, Crocodile Army. Well, another week, another mass shooting in the United States. I don't entirely know what the solution to this is, and I'm not sure that anyone does. But I can tell you with confidence that nothing of substance is going to happen. As we saw after the Sandy Hook massacre, when something like 20 kids around 6 years old were shot dead, the Republicans in Congress are not willing to institute even very basic law. This is untrue. What you mean to say, or what you should say rather, to accurately model the situation, is to say that Republicans in Congress are unwilling to pass more and more laws. Uh, the many hundreds of federal laws that we have and the many thousands of laws throughout this country uh, regulating firearms in various ways got there with the cooperation of, of the Republicans. Um, and indeed, I know it's, a, it's a, a Democrat talking point that the, the NRA is the big boogeyman here. Uh, much of our federal legislation was lobbied for and written in part, in large part, in some cases entirely, by the NRA itself. If you go back and look in the 1930s uh, through the 60s, in fact, not, not until your lifetime and mine, did the NRA ever stumble across a single gun control law that it didn't like. Uh, it wrote laws in New York, it went and lobbied the Congress and said, hey, look what we've done in New York, we proposed this in New York and a couple of other states. Uh, you can import this pretty much wholesale, and then you have some federal legislation on the matter to even put up a speed bump up to prevent people from having guns. That assumes that any of the laws being proposed by the Democrats, you and your friends, uh, actually will have the effect that you claim the laws will have. Now, I will point out here that every law, without exception, that we have uh, on this issue now, when it was argued for and, uh, and accepted, came with that same right, or that this will do something. You know, they, uh, they ever... Uh, the, 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 they ever sought after something that needs to be done to address the issue. The, all the laws that we have, when they were passed and led into law, uh, they were argued for as being, uh, being legislation that would do great work towards solving this problem. The, it would be that something. None of them has worked. And yet, after a, nearly a century of this having happened, nevertheless, you stand here. Again, I'm going to presume you're new to this. And you say that uh, passing uh, just a few more laws will be the something, or at least some work towards that something, that needs to happen. Now, being aware that there are laws that exist that were uh, before this happened, uh, that were argued for in that way, and that have failed to produce the effect that people uh, claim that they would, in fact, produce, what is sensible about following that same line? Uh, when the laws that, that are claimed to do something are passed into law, and then they don't do it, what is the sense in passing more of just that type, the same type of legislation into law on the same argument, that it will do this, this ever sought after something? Uh, I'm not persuaded. Now, as it happens, there, there could be several reasons for why the laws uh, don't work. And one of the, one of the uh, you claim that the Republicans are unwilling to do anything, which is just false. One of the reasons that the laws, uh, a potential reason that the laws don't do what uh, they were claimed they, what was claimed they would do when, when they were argued for, is that the laws uh, on the issues you're going to address here aren't enforced. Violations of these laws aren't enforced. And if uh, I don't know if you watch congressional hearings. I have that kind of free time. Uh, I'm pretty sure neither your audience nor my audience is populated by people who are just, oh boy, congressional hearings are happening. I can't wait to sit, by, sit you know, and watch six hours of this today and 12 hours of it you know, later in the week, you know, whatever it is. But one of the things that was brought up by the Republicans and conveniently ignored by the Democrats, uh, with some exceptions, were uh, the, the testimony of the, the experts they, they called in, United States attorneys. Uh, in this case, they were Democratic appointees, but this would be true of Republican appointees, too. Uh, so uh, you had United States attorneys, chiefs of police, uh, law enforcement officials, and uh, there, were, there was a common theme uh, without an exception, among those experts, the people, um, or supposed experts anyway, the people tasked at any rate with enforcing these laws and prosecuting their violations. And it was, we don't have time for it. 
Uh, we don't do paperwork crimes. We don't waste any money on this. It's not worth our time. The straw purchasers, despite the fact those argue that we need more legislation, the current legislation on it, no prosecutions or practically no prosecutions in the entire United States, and indeed less than one prosecution per year per United States attorney. Um, these are things that factor into the calculus about the reasonable, reasonableness of enacting into to law further measures, uh, further steps on the same types of uh, same types of issues. Why another database when the current one, when the law is violated, the United States attorneys say we're not going to we're not going to prosecute. Don't have time for it. Don't care about that. Not worth the money. When the police chiefs tell you, I don't spend any time, any effort, any resources, any officer's time. I don't spend a penny on chasing paperwork crimes. There are actual crimes out there that we're focused on enforcing, and these aren't it. Nevertheless, give us a whole new series of the same types of laws that we will continue in the future not to enforce. So, what is the common sense, and here I'm using common sense in its highest uh, form, uh, to mean rational, reasonable, proportional. What is the common sense in passing more of that when the people tasked with enforcing it and tasked with prosecuting its violations are telling you? We already don't care about it. We already refuse to enforce these laws. Now, mind you, you might think, well, maybe you could pass a rule, that, a law or whatever, that mandates that they enforce these. Uh, you can't do that in the United States. You could do it in other countries, but in the United States, you can't. Uh, officers here have discretion on which laws they do and don't enforce. They have, uh, this is why I laugh about uh, people who talk about uh, so-called mandatory arrest laws on like domestic violence and whatnot. There's no such law in the United States. There are laws that are termed that, but there's no actual mandatory arrest statute, and there really can't be. The only way you could really get that is, is to waive sovereign immunity, uh, so that way the, the government becomes liable for the crimes that it fails to prevent and arrests that it fails to uh, effect, which um, it doesn't take a, a, a rocket scientist, a rocket surgeon, to figure out that if the government becomes financially liable for what it fails to do, it will become immediately bankrupt because of all the crime that it's not capable of, uh, of, of preventing and all of the, the crimes that happen is not capable of affecting arrests as a consequence of. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, those just aren't live options here unless you want to trim off a little fat from the separation of powers from the Constitution. And I know that many people on various sides, uh, uh, when the parts of the Constitution they don't much care about come, you know, come up, they're willing to trim that fat. I happen to care about the whole fucking document, you know, every kit and caboodle, all the amendments. I don't uh, pick and choose which is more important. I'm, I'm not a Democrat, so uh, I, I like the Second Amendment just as much as I like the First. And I'm not a Republican or a conservative, so I like the fourth and the fifth as much as I like the second and the first. That is to say, I, I don't accept uh, a diminution in right to counsel, jury trial, um, searches, you know, prohibitions against unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, you know, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. I'm in for it all. If the law that governs me is going to be uh, absolute, I don't get exceptions because I had a, I come up with a clever excuse. No, you're still guilty. You'll still be prosecuted then the government should thereby be bound by the same fucking instrument that creates it as, it, it as I am by the laws that are enacted to govern me. And the Constitution is a restraint on that power, and it should be, uh, very, it should be hewed to very closely. So, um, what, what's the rationality in doing in the future precisely what has happened in the past that hasn't produced the effects that everyone who agitates for these laws every time they come up, claims will be the effect produced by these laws. And it doesn't take a mathematician to figure out that if you just follow this to its logical conclusion and look at the last century of its trajectory, the end result is pretty much a near ban for most people in most circumstances. You know, like the Democrats will tell you. In the one, on the one hand, we're not, nobody's talking about a gun ban, which is trivially false. All you have to do is read what they write. Uh, the, the opinion pieces appearing by various uh, politicians and Democrat talking heads. They talk about gun bans. But, uh, you know, and, and the, the ones who don't uh, at least admit they're talking about a gun ban will say things. We're not talking about confiscate, forced confiscations and gun bans. But, you know, sensible regulations can happen. Look at Australia. Look at the United Kingdom. You know, they point to all these countries. Well, I've looked at those countries, and I've seen what they have. It is a near ban for most people, under most circumstances. Um, and indeed, uh, so when they, the exemplars that they point to are countries that have enacted near-total bans. 
Now, of course, Paul Clement, when he was Solicitor General and arguing in D.C. against Heller, he pointed out that technically the machine gun ban we have in the United States isn't a ban because there are exceptions. You know, there are something like a couple hundred thousand of them out there that they didn't go confiscate. So that's not technically a ban, but it is a functional ban. Now, that argument is always available. If you let one citizen, for any reason, have any firearm of any type, then you can say we haven't banned them. See, Frank Smith, who lives in North Dakota uh, and owns, owns like a... I don't know, a pig farm or whatever, where they slaughter it. He gets to have one gun that he uses to slaughter the, the pigs, therefore not a ban. That is a logically true argument, but it's a complete bullshit political argument. Uh, anyway. So, why, sh why should I not be concerned about that as a gun owner and a person who is all about the Second Amendment and all the rest of the Constitution? Why should that not make me think that I'm being lied to by the Democrats, particularly when they point to countries that have done precisely that sort of thing, and they say that's the exemplar. Well, if that's the exemplar, you know, to use a British expression, in for a penny, in for a pound, and I guess the response to that would be a Tom Lehrer expression, penny-wise, the pound is foolish. It's one of those expressions that hardly anyone expresses. ...didn't have them, nor do they seem willing to increase mental health program spending. I should also note that branding any mass killer is... Well, I also note that if you go back to the 60s, I believe it was uh, progressives and liberals who didn't like the the uh, civil commitments for, you know, people who were, you know, mentally bewildered. Um, you know, they, they kind of really fought against that. Y you can't have it both ways. Don't, don't go talking about uh, this being any kind of source of concern when your party, I'm presuming you're a Democrat, I've never seen you disagree with the Democrat talking point, maybe there are some, and I'd like to see um, where you and the party diverge, but, you know, putting it off to the side is not relevant here. Um, when, when they oppose as you do oppose stigmatizing uh, the, the, you know, the mentally bewildered because they are, after all, the overwhelming majority of them aren't threats, which I take to be true. I also note that the overwhelming majority of gun owners aren't threats, but you're perfectly fine with having rules that, in, that, uh, that do things to them. So apparently in the progressive camp, the, the Democrat camp, it's less of a secular sin if you stigmatize an ever larger proportion of the population, but it's somehow verboten to stigmatize a small fraction of it. I don't understand why that works, but I don't claim that uh, people who are um, politically ideological are rational actors. Automatically mentally ill is simplistic and unhelpful to the vast majority of mentally ill who are not... Then why is saying that it's helpful to treat in advance, which is what uh, background checks do, they treat in advance all citizens as though none of them can be trusted until they prove uh, to your satisfaction and, and more importantly the government's satisfaction that they can be provisionally trusted. By the way, um, these background checks, they don't do anything about, uh, they're not anticipatory of future criminal conduct, they only look back at previous uh, crimes and I note that uh, the mass murders that um, people like to talk about Generally, the mass murderer passes all of the, the checks that, uh, that were claimed to have been effective at being able to catch them, which they really can't. And even when they do catch these people, the government has no interest in prosecuting them, just FYI, until they actually go out and commit murders or other serious crimes. All violent. How is that sensible? It looks like we're just going to have more of these mass shootings forever. <laughs> Might as well get used to it and embrace the new normal. It isn't the new normal. It is just a consequence of liberties that not uh, all bad things can be stopped. And even in, uh, indeed, even if you uh, decide to cut a little fat off the Constitution and trim these liberties, you still can't uh, stop these things from happening. They still happen in Australia. They still happen in the United Kingdom. I realize that there's a, uh, a cavalcade of people running around saying, uh, since the gun ban, which we're not trying to ban your guns, but look to Australia and see what they did, but we won't take yours, we promise. Uh, trust us, we're politicians. <laughs> we would never, you know, pander or lie. Anyway, uh, they happen in Australia. Um, it, it, there's a cavalcade of people who say these things just haven't happened in Australia since the gun ban, even when it's trivially easy to see that they have. They haven't happened in the United Kingdom since the gun ban, even though it's trivially easy to see that they have. But anyway, uh, I just point that out. Hey, we could even make a game out of it. We can call... No. No, no, no. In the same breath that people on your side will complain that politicians and other people interested in this aren't taking it seriously, you're going to propose it. This is not a game. These are real people's lives that are being taken. These are real people's liberties that you're proposing be, in, be uh, 
trod upon just a little bit more than they already are. Uh, I don't pick and choose among which parts of the Constitution I like and dislike, uh, you know, the rights. They're all equal to me. They're all a restraint on the government. The government should obey them. They should hew closely to that. I think I've already said it. Um, I take these liberties very seriously, and I'm very suspicious of claims that we want to infringe upon it just a little bit, but we won't go any further, we promise, because it's never true. It, that never happens. There's always a next step. And one of the reasons there's always a next step is that what's proposed to be a solution never is a solution on these types of issues. And one of the reasons it's never a solution is there are just evil people who are going to find the means to effectuate their evil purposes no matter what you do. Uh, and I'm, I'm, of the, I'm of the same opinion on this as Thomas Jefferson. I prefer a little dangerous liberty to a bit of peaceful slavery, which is kind of odd for him to have been saying when he said it, but putting it off to the side. This is not a game. And if you're going to do like a comedy video, don't do it in the same part where you're whining and complaining about the lack of seriousness and the lack of action uh, that, that is being invested in this. It's, it, it's just really fucking queer. Oh, the Fantasy Shootings League. It'll be just like fantasy football, except our... Only we get to bury children and other victims of mass murder season will last the whole year. We'll hold our draft in December, and starting January 1st, every bullet will count. All shootings of three or more killed, including the gunman, will... This is one of the problems. When we talk about these things, we need to break the link between conflating mass shooting and mass murder. They're mass murders. They're not mass shootings. They're mass murders, or attempted mass murders. There is a criminal, and there are victims. And when you let this, uh this little conflation happen where you can interchange these, you start getting this kind of morally repugnant nonsense where the murderer gets counted as one of the victims. I am so over the moon tired of seeing this from liberals and progressives and Democrats. Uh, I'm sure I'm repeating myself there in some sense. Talking, of, you know, the, one of the things, like Washington Post had this and a couple of other people have posted up this, uh, mass shootings, you know, and then in parentheses, counting four or more dead, including the shooter, the murderer. He is not the victim. There is no definition used in law enforcement of mass shooting. There are mass murders and attempted mass murderers. And the FBI definition, the one that's generally used by law enforcement, is four or more persons killed in a single incident without a cooling off period, uh, so as to distinguish it from serial killing. And uh, they used to try to draw distinctions between mass murders and spree killings, but that's not an actual useful distinction to be drawn. The law enforcement's getting away from that. The media will be years behind trying to catch up on it. There is, uh, in no judicial opinion or statute uh, definition, uh, that includes the murderer as one of the dead, as one of the victims. Because when they talk about the people who are shot, they're talking about the victims, not the perpetrator of the crime. Now, there is a 28 U.S.C. 530C B, 1, M, little i, big i, that has, uh, for authorizing funds for in the wake of these things, when it's three or more murder victims or attempted uh, murder victims, but that still does not count the murderer. He's not counted in the statistics because it is, because it is, it is adding insult to injury to consider the murderer, one of the fucking victims of the murders he's carrying out. This would be much akin to talking about uh, uh, make it a really egregious child rape and say, well, you know, actually two victims in every child rape. There's, of course, the child is being raped, but then think about the rapist. I mean, he has to deal with the kid screaming and the look on the kid's face. So really, there are there are two victims in those rapes. It's kind of like the you know the the back room joke about uh, you know, being in Auschwitz. It was it was a, a really really hard for the people in Auschwitz. I mean, the Nazis had to listen to those kids getting chucked in the fucking uh, ovens all day long. Can you imagine what that does to a Nazi? It, it might be a, a you know good dark humor. In, in a clear comedy set, but in a supposedly serious conversation about issues of moment, it is repugnant to intersperse that in there, in my view. So why do you why do you why do you think that's appropriate? The murderer should not be counted among his victims. There is a distinction to be drawn between the people who are victims of genocide and those who carry it out. There's a distinction to be drawn between the people who are murdered by these murderers and the murderer himself. And anyone who blurs that line even a little bit, is speaking contemptibly, and should be treated with the scorn he is rightly invited. Yeah. And, just in case it's not clear, there's a distinction to be drawn between the rape victim 
and the rapist and anybody who in any sense blurs that line is speaking contemptibly and should rightly receive the scorn he has properly earned. Well, for someone in the league to score points. In our mock draft, we'll have all kinds of players available. <laughs> we can have every state in the United States, every month of the year, types of locations, different types of... Well, if we're going to play your stupid little game, there's not going to be much risk in choosing types of locations. And the reason for that is these are rationally chosen by bad actors. It is predictable where these events happen, and it's predictable where they don't happen. Because when they're attempted in certain places, they go nowhere. You have a death count that's approximately one. There are reasons that there aren't mass murders that are perpetrated in police departments. There are reasons that there are excuse me, that there aren't mass murders perpetrated at NRA conventions or gun conventions generally. When people try these things, they live, their lifespan is measured in moments, in seconds, not, ha not half an hour, not an hour. It's in seconds to a minute. And the reason is quite clear. Only a moron uh, one, who wants to actually be able to pull off a, a, a mass murder walks into a place where he will be immediately cut down, which is what happens when it's tried in police departments. And people do try this in police departments every year. It goes nowhere. These people, who are clearly not entirely right in the head, aren't irrational. They rationally choose their victims. And it is predictable what they choose, and they choose them precisely because they know they have a lot of free time to murder their victims. <clears throat> Guns and even other... And in, in, in case you're curious, these places are advertised. You put signs out front that announce, gun-free zone, gun-free zone. Oh, and uh, I guess I could do a whole separate video about this, but in the wake of the UCC uh, school shooting, uh, there's a debate about whether or not uh, it was a gun-free zone, whether it wasn't a gun-free zone. It is uh, a gun-free zone for the following reason. Um, I'll put links to the uh, legal decisions below in the statute or at least I'll try to remember to do that. But there's a statute in Oregon that makes an exception to the criminal law uh, for carrying concealed weapons in public buildings for people who have a concealed weapons permit. Okay? Then uh, the school boards, uh, the state university system, whatever the hell they call the board, that the grand poobahs who uh, pass uh, administrative rules on these things, passed an administrative rule prohibiting students, teachers, whoever, uh, and or any other person or every other person from carrying... Uh, firearms on the camp in the, the buildings of the campus, notwithstanding having a concealed weapons permit, there's no exception written into that. So there was a gun rights group that a uh, gun shooting club, I think it was, that that uh, took a lawsuit about this, and the Oregon uh, appellate court that struck down the administrative rule said that it exceeded the board's power to pass an administrative rule that prohibited other persons, uh, but it was perfectly within its power to prohibit it to the students, the teachers. Uh, faculty, staff, those kinds of people. And indeed, they went so far as to rule that notwithstand, not the fact that there is an exemption for a criminal prosecution generally does not say anything about what, uh, does not indicate any in, intent of the legislature to prescribe the board's power to prohibit uh, weapons in its facilities. And so in the wake of that, was, I think that happened in 2011, was when that ruling came down in 2012, you know, the following session, they, re they uh, again, the board, again, prohibited those items from, uh, from the interior, from the facilities on the campus to students, teachers, staff, faculty, those kinds of people. And indeed, you sign a little thing before you can be a student there agreeing to forfeit that right, as such as I understand it anyway, in order to be admitted as a student or to work there. So um, there's that. Now, on the guy who apparently had a firearm on the campus, it's my understanding that the staff actively prohibited him, from, uh, prohibited him from going into the building where the shooting was happening to try to stop it. They actually physically restrained him. That's my understanding. Uh, I would like to see uh, more about that. Uh, hopefully more about that will come out in the future. But continue as a bit of an aside. Weapons, if you'd like, though I suspect those won't get a lot of points. Various final body count numbers will be available, and you'll get bonus points for owning two or more of the factors that... Well, if we're going to play, once again, your stupid game... Uh, every year you could really uh, get just about uh, dead even if you, if these mass shootings that you want to talk about, if you choose uh, a number slightly smaller than the number of people who are killed in lightning strikes in the United States, that's where you need to, to, to uh, place your bet, because that's about what it tends to be um, when, we, when we don't have people in the media and the Democrats and other groups, by the way, 
who are playing musical definitions for whatever's convenient so they can really jack up their number to include counting the murderer as a victim of the crime he has perpetrated. Fit the shooting. Then at the end of the year, we'll crown a winner and send the results to Wayne LaPierre of the NRA and every politician that refuses to even lift a finger to help reduce the number. It isn't the politicians who refuse to lift a finger. They refuse to, uh, some of them refuse to go along with new legislation, but it's law enforcement and prosecutors who refuse to lift the finger. Um, go watch the hearings and watch the testimony. When police officers and prosecutors uh, come under oath, come into, come into the Congress under oath or anywhere else under oath, and they promise you, look, this is not important to us, you should take them at their word. When they're declining to uh, effect arrests, when they're declining to initiate investigations, when they're declining to file charges, when they're declining to pursue prosecutions because they don't think it's important, and they're telling you they don't think it's important, you can actually believe that. They really mean it. When they say this is unimportant, we have real crimes to worry about, not, not chasing paperwork, they, they mean it. ...mass shootings, thanking them for their part in making the game fun. How's that for making lemonade out of lemons? If any politicians actually did want to help with this problem, there are plenty of ways they could do it without running afoul of the Second Amendment. You could still allow... There are... There are indeed things that could be done that would not run afoul of the Second Amendment or any other amendment uh, such as I. I know. Um, unfortunately, people don't like these solutions. Uh, they deride some of them. Again, I, I mentioned that it's predictable why shootings happen in certain places and not others. They don't happen in police departments and gun conventions for obvious reasons. But somehow if you propose that you have uh, armed teachers, that's idiotic for some reason. Now, um, this was uh, addressed in some of the hearings. You can go watch the testimony. One of the police chiefs mentioned, um, uh, apparently teachers can't be trusted with firearms. What if they leave their guns just lying around? That's a concern. Well, of course. But that's true of law enforcement. I mean, what if a cop just puts his gun, you know, leaves it out in the parking lot and goes inside and some kid gets it and blows his head off? I guess the cops can't be trusted with guns. No, you, you, don't, tr you don't use extreme circumstances to make, to make rules. Extreme cases make for bad laws. Extreme cases make for bad decisions. Anyway, um... Uh, one, of the, one of the police chiefs was saying something like, these, these are people who spend their whole lives uh, learning how to teach and, and uh, focusing on, on teaching. That is just false. They spend their professional lives doing that. Many of them do it after having had long careers in the military and then retiring. They spend their professional lives doing that. They have hobbies, they have families, uh, all kinds of things. Many of them are gun enthusiasts and would be happy to carry, uh, to carry on campus. And indeed, there's even a couple of incidents in the United States where uh, armed staff, not armed security, armed uh, teachers have more. I, I'm aware of one case where uh, a principal, an assistant principal, went out to his car, got a gun, and challenged a, a shooter on the campus who surrendered immediately. But for some reason, that doesn't count as preventing a mass murder to, to the liberals uh, because mass murderers, mass murders you see are incidents where a certain number of people have been shot and killed. And if uh, those number of people haven't been shot and killed, that just doesn't count because it's not a mass murder. You know. uh, so I guess if, if uh, gun carriers want uh, the liberals to have to deal with this, the progressives to actually have to deal with this, they should stand there and wait until the fourth corpse hit the floor and then put the guy down. Except then it would be a mass murder and clearly you didn't prevent it. It's the perfect catch-22. Uh, you know, welcome to hell. Pick a door. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Anyway, um... <clears throat> Uh, one, of the, one of the fears is, well, having untrained teachers carrying guns doesn't make sense. I agree. The, uh, so, too, with this argument, uh, not make sense. You know, we should have untrained police officers. No one would believe that. They should be trained. So, the solution there is to say, well, you know, uh, between the option of not having them and having them be trained, I guess we have to go with not having them. No, it's obviously, you make them, if they want to carry on campus, they have to go uh, to training. And, of course, you could require close, uh, their liaising with law enforcement. One of the fears is, will law enforcement come in? We wouldn't know who to shoot. It would the law enforcement know the teachers. <laughs> I, don't see, I don't see much of a downside between teachers working with law enforcement uh, in the prevention of crime. I do see a downside to having police officers on campus because then it, it gives the false notion to students as they're raised up with having these government agents with guns around being told these are your friends when they're not. They're there to. They're not there to be counselors. They're not there to be advisors. They're there to arrest and see to your prosecution. Uh, they're not your friends. Uh, when, when law enforcement comes to talk to you, typically it's never, it's never advantageous for you uh, to consider them to be your friends. They are looking, <clears throat> when they're doing investigations, for people to arrest.
handguns or sh Oh, and back on that Oregon law and the UCC shooting, it was an affirmative defense to a prosecution, to a conviction, that you had a concealed weapons permit. An affirmative defense means that after you've been arrested, put in jail, and then brought to trial, you and the prosecution puts on its case, then you have to prove to the jury, I think in this case it's a preponderance of the evidence, that notwithstanding everything that the prosecution said, that this other fact is true, and because this other fact is true, if the jury believes it to be true, they should nevertheless find you not guilty. So it wasn't just an exemption, it was an affirmative defense that could be raised after you've spent time in jail. Guns. Higher magazine capacity guns should require more scrutiny, but a Why? principle drill into the details to stall that conversation. Laws regulating the ability to purchase a gun if you're a felon or if you have certain <clears throat> mental health issues exist in some places. The one against felons exists in all places in the United States. Uh, the one against mentally uh, bewildered folks from possessing firearms exists in all states, though it's not enforced properly. Some of the states uh, cooperate better than others in these t in the uh, mental health cases um, for various reasons. I don't really understand uh, the reasons. I've, I've never seen any real in-depth articles on it. Maybe they're out there, and if you know of any, you know, go ahead and give them to me. So these things exist everywhere. Uh, the extent to which they're enforced is variable. Making that a national registry and tied to every day. Although I will note, nowhere in the United States do they care about felons attempting to unlawfully uh, purchase weapons, though, uh, you know, they'll wait until they possess them and then arrest them for that, as opposed to arresting them when they're attempting to procure them, uh, thereby preventing the future crime. Because they don't chase paperwork uh, crimes. The base you can tie it to that's relevant would be a good idea for instant background checks. Some of this has been done already, but some has not. Not every disturbed loner has the wherewithal to get a gun illegally, and if they do, it just gives them another opportunity to get caught. The typical argument... Let me ask you, by the way, um, you know, because like I'm told, look at Australia. I've looked at them and their gun bans. By the way, credit to the Australian people who have found ways around those laws and have rearmed themselves to the point uh, beyond which uh, they were when the gun bans went into effect. By the way, a good PR term there was it was called a government buyback as opposed to <clears throat> um, forced confiscation. There's no such thing as a government buyback of firearms. It's not possible to buy back that which you didn't own in the first place. It's a forced confiscation. But anyway, putting that off to the side, uh, I have a question for you, Zonstar. Given a forced choice, which uh, I'm told most murders tend to be first forced choices, the murderers aren't like, do you want to live or die? And you say live, and they go, oh, shit. Um, they're, they're forced choices. Would you rather be shot through the head or uh, burned at the stake? The reason I ask is because I've looked at Australia, and while uh, the gun mass murders have gone down, mass murders are happening now at a higher rate than they've happened uh, in some parts of its past, like the first, you know, uh, there's like a half a century or 75 years there, where what, what's happening there now is much higher than that, and uh, there was a, anyway. Uh, one, of, one of the mass murder tools that's used in lieu of guns now is locking people in buildings and burning them to death. And I'm curious, which would you rather have happen to you? Which would you rather know? You know, I, I've, I've not uh, read any, any gravestones where someone was burned at the stake and says, well, thank God he wasn't shot to death. Then again, I've not read anywhere it says, at least I didn't die from a gun. Um, it, now, it seems to be that we, we, we well, it doesn't seem to be, we in fact tend to think of uh, quick killings as less egregious than slow, torturous, painful ones. Uh, and indeed, this is carried out in our, our, the way we execute people. We are going to, uh, we, we try ever more humane sounding to us ways of putting people to death. We've never allowed, uh, in the United States, we've never allowed burning people at the stake. Uh, or, uh, you know, the cruel and unusual punishment prohibition in the Eighth Amendment doesn't, doesn't debar um, the death penalty. What it does debar is torturous, torturous methods of death. That is to say, methods of death where one of the purposes of it is to inflict uh, gratuitous pain to, when uh, it is meant to humiliate, it is meant to be undignified, it is meant to cause the person to suffer. Um, not just that there's some incidental pain that goes along with hanging them or the you know, electric chair or whatever it is. Well, electric chair wasn't around at the time, but you get the point. So you couldn't go out of your way to inflict torture. Uh, you had to try to avoid that to the extent that, the, that you could. <clears throat> One of the ways that we did that is by not burning people to death. We <clears throat> They were hanged. 
and then later they were and we have a lot of draw, drawing and quartering and things of that nature and then the gas chamber and the death uh, the electric chair and firing squads uh, we've never permitted for example butchering squads you don't you know all right guys here's your knives go out there and stick the person to death uh, another way that mass murders have been perpetrated um, genocides have been perpetrated with cutlery <clears throat> but anyway um, so it's not like you're going to stop mass murderers uh, to the extent that you have any effect, the most that you're going to do is change the, the methods that they use to perpetrate these crimes. Uh, they don't seem to be any deadlier when it's a gun versus locking people in a building and setting it on fire. So, which would you rather have? Just out of curiosity. Um, you know, I'm just curious what you might think there. For my own part, just FYI, if, uh, if I'm going to be murdered, I would much prefer a bullet through the head than to be uh, slowly hacked to death or set on fire. NRA supporters is that if someone wants a gun, they'll get one somehow. So let's not have any gun laws. It's a true... Please name an NRA member who argues that point. Uh, not, not some weird reference to someone out there. Give me a name of one you've heard say it. Please, I would like to go see what this person says and argue with them. I would love to argue with, with a nutbag on my side of the argument um, who, who proposes such a thing. <clears throat> idiotic argument. It would be. Never heard an NRA member propose it. It's not used for any other type of crime for some reason. The same reason it's not used for that. Then uh, or, or by NRA member do you mean anarchists? Barf <clears throat> up about 30 memes on their Facebook feeds about how guns don't kill people, or maybe we should just ban knives too, or how the gun... Ah, well one of the reasons that comes up it's precisely because when people on your side say, look what happened, we've, it's happened in Australia, it's happened in the United Kingdom, we've looked at their legislation. And indeed, we looked at what they're trying to get into law now. For example, in the United Kingdom, they're trying to enact a law that uh, builds a legal presumption in, into the law that if you are in public with a knife, for whatever reason, I guess, you are legally presumed to have malicious intent and therefore are guilty of a crime. In other words, carrying a knife in public, pocket knife, butcher knife, whatever it is, they, they want to make that unlawful. I think it's fair when people point to these various places to say, well, when you say look at what they're doing, or look what they've done, do you really mean it, or is it just bullshit? And uh, why should gun owners like myself, who are all in favor of the Second Amendment and other civil liberties, why shouldn't we look at that and say, and be nervous about that? Would you be okay with a a known Jew list or a an avowed homosexual list? Of course you wouldn't be, because you understand what that's been used for in the past. Gun owners understand what gun registries and all these other things have been used for in the past, and, and we're just as nervous about those lists as anybody should be about a list of known and avowed Jews, known and avowed homosexuals, or other heretical type folks. So why why shouldn't I be concerned about that? It better not come and take their guns. Pronounce government like government on those types of memes for linguistic accuracy. The issue of... Ah, uh, the slight that those folks who's in favor of gun rights is is them inbred stupid southerners who all are worried about them uppity niggers coming in to take their shit and them, them Mexicans coming across the border to take their jobs. You know, um, it, it's quick and easy to point to that and, and well, if you have a southern accent, you're clearly stupid, even though it's not true. I'm from the south. I'm extremely well educated, and indeed I'm better educated than you are, actually, Zonstar. Uh, not to be too rude about it. Uh, so, uh, it's easy to go after the low-hanging fruit, which, whether or not it is, you believe it to be the case. Go after the tough cases. Try that instead. It's a little bit more intellectually honest. Culture is very relevant to these shootings. I've seen people blame part of this on competitive... Right, which is why they happen in places like really pro-gun control areas and gun-free zones. Maybe there is something about the culture there. Perhaps if, if criminals got it in their mind that the moment you start to engage in some of these various acts, you will instantly be killed, they would choose to do otherwise. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't, but in either case, uh, if they do choose it, just like what happens in police departments, the, the consequences of their bad choices would be limited. Just possibly.
sports, not enough Jesus, or parents not beating their kids enough. People kill because they feel they've been wronged. Dylan Roof killed several people, and Vester Flanagan wrote that this act inspired him to kill two people. The latest shooter wrote that he... This act? The most recent one that happened after? Anyway. Um, look, don't be, all quick, don't be too quick to accept what murderers are telling you about their reasons. Here, here is a conjecture that possibly there are evil people who mean to do evil things and that they glom on to whatever sounds convenient to justify their actions. It's like listening to serial killers. Um, oh, I also note that um, whatever it is that has received wisdom about why people do these things, that's what they cite to. When you go listen to serial killers talk about why they've done their crimes, uh, one, of the, one of the common uh, things is why because this is common in the academy and in the media and feminism and you know, the social justice people, uh, this is a dominant theme, and serial killers are now mimicking that in what they say. Well, I just looked at these people as, as objects. No, that's not true. In fact, they chose their victims precisely because they weren't just objects. They have particular features that are unique to humans and are unique to animals that can experience fear and pain and all these other things, and that's what they go after. It's possible, just maybe, that, that serial killers, psychopaths, are manipulative people who are lying to psychiatrists and other goal, or uh, psychologists, social workers and whatnot, and other gullible people, and telling them what these people already want to hear because it's what these people already believe. And I'm going to cut off your video there. And in response to other things that could be, that could be done, if you want to look at solutions that are effective, that actually have promise. Look at what happens when there are people and, and who work in a profession where their actual job is to safeguard the lives of other people and see what they do and don't do. For example, look at what the Secret Service does and doesn't do. The first thing is, you make it difficult for bad guys to get in. That's one way. On the interior, you, you know, concentric circles of defense. Now, of course, you're not going to make every school in the land like, like the White House or anything like that. But look at Sandy Hook. These people were concerned about security, as they should be. When you have people's lives in your hand, and their safety is uh, one of your responsibilities, you should care about this a little bit. And then they hired complete idiots to harden the site, to, re to increase the security of the building, reinforce doors and whatnot. What did the person do? He put a reinforced door next to an ordinary window. How did the killer get entrance into the building? He broke out the ordinary window, reached in, opened the door, and had a field day. There are things that can be done. Armed teachers, an option. Happen, you know, it, it, it's true in at least one state, and no mass murders in their schools there. Maybe it's a fluke, who knows. It's an avenue worth, worth a, a pursuing. Making it difficult for people to get in, that doesn't stop, uh, that it won't necessarily stop. Um, people who are already students, like in the most recent case, there you need something more than just a, a hardened exterior to unwanted people because he was one of the group. Um, so there, there are things that can be done. Passing laws that uh, are extensions of laws that we already have that aren't being enforced is not sensible. And it is a cheap and dishonest point for many people on the left, uh, who I'm not presuming have just stumbled in this conversation this last week, <clears throat> to say that the Republicans are the ones who are resisting things, uh, resisting, resisting measures. Republicans are very big on law and order. We have plenty of laws, but not a lot of order. And the reason for that is that the enforcement branch, you know, the executive, is declining to focus resources on it, and in fact is refusing to focus resources on it. And the prosecutors, part of the executive, the hybrid judicial officers in, in certain respects, are refusing to prosecute. Uh, for all these attempts that I've mentioned uh, on these so-called paperwork crimes, fewer than one prosecution per United States attorney in a year. Um, so, <clears throat> just to point out here, all every time these laws are proposed, it's always claimed they'll have they'll produce particular effects. Those effects never obtain, and the solution is an ever uh, you know, an, an ever repeating cycle of we need more and more laws when none of the none of the new laws are rigorously enforced. And the Republicans, in large part, are saying, how about we just see if uh, enforcement of these laws will do some great work towards this. Let's start there. Let's try that on laws we already have before further infringing on the rights of innocent Americans who haven't done anything, which is what 
uh, these checks presume is that no citizens can be trusted, that they're all a little bit shady and they need to be checked upon by the government before they can en enjoy their rights. <clears throat> I'm a little bit like Thomas Jefferson. I think I already said this, but I'll say it again. I prefer a little dangerous liberty, uh, liberty, a little dangerous liberty to a peaceful slavery. Have a good day.